Yeah, so. Hi, my name is Mike Tierney. I teach in the government department and I'm the director of the Global Research Institute here at William & Mary. I'd like to welcome you all to our discussion tonight on the war on Ukraine. Um, I think I speak for all of us when I say I, I wish we were here under different circumstances. But I expect this will be the first of many conversations as the effects of this war and the world's reactions to this war uh, are gonna shape international politics, economics, and the future of democracy around the world for years to come. So those are some of the things that we're gonna explore tonight. Um, I think this war is likely to become what international relations scholars call a benchmark event, meaning it will not only shape what we teach and how we do research here at William and Mary and in the, in the broader discipline, it's also gonna shape our lives in fundamental ways. Uh, we don't know how that's gonna work out exactly, but I think tonight uh, we have three great panelists who can start to sketch out some of the ideas and uh, look for some of, those, uh, some of those patterns. So as I mentioned earlier, tonight's event is brought to you by William Mary's Global Research Institute. GRI is a multidisciplinary hub that brings, to, brings together academics, practitioners, and students to conduct applied research on pressing global issues. GRI houses 10 different research labs, and two of those research labs are represented here tonight on the panel. So this evening we have experts on Russian history and politics, international security, and disinformation. And we have intentionally not restricted the panel to old people with PhDs. Uh, thank you, Lincoln. Uh, we, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not even gonna go there. Um, so the format tonight is gonna be pretty straightforward. It's gonna be, each of the speakers is gonna be given 10 minutes to talk about their reactions to uh, current events. Uh, then I'll do some moderated Q&A for about another 10 or 15 minutes, allow the speakers to engage with each other, and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A from the audience for the last 45 minutes. Um, so we're only gonna take questions from people that are here in the audience, uh, not the people online. I am told by Rebecca, who put this whole, whole thing together. Where is Rebecca? Rebecca is right over here. Thank you, Rebecca. In very short notice, she got, a, she got an email at four in the morning about two or three days ago saying, I've got a great idea. And so thank you, Rebecca, for putting this together. But I'm told we have about 600 people joining us uh, online for this event. So uh, really great work and, and so super important uh, topics for tonight. So I'm gonna introduce the speakers as they step up to go. And so our first speaker tonight is gonna be my boss, Steve Hansen. Steve is William Mary's Vice Provost for International and Academic Affairs. He's a professor in the government department and a research affiliate at the Global Research Institute. Dr. Hansen is one of the world's leading scholars of Russian and post-Soviet politics. He's written five books and published over 40 peer-reviewed journal articles. He's currently working on a book project analyzing the causes and consequences of political regime change in comparative and historical contexts. Steve, will you get us started? Thank you so much, Mike, uh, for that generous introduction. Let me go ahead and see if this is working well. So there's the slide. So this will probably go without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. The stakes could not possibly be higher for the things that we are now experiencing as we speak, as we sit here tonight. Uh, this war is taking a turn, unfortunately, that could be extremely damaging, even more so uh, than what we've seen already, which has been bloody and awful. The biggest war in Europe since World War II, uh, and that does include wars, right? So there were wars in the former Yugoslavia. There was the, uh, the Russian annexation of Ukraine earlier, an invasion of the Donbass in 2014. Before that, there was uh, Russia's detachment of areas of Georgia from its sovereign territory. So we can go back and look at other, I, I definitely don't wanna discount that there have been armed conflicts in this period. But the scale of what we're seeing now is something that none of us in our lifetimes have seen, except for those who uh, really are quite old now. And it will change your life, for sure. Let's also state really clearly, because unfortunately the Putin propaganda machine tries to say other things, that this was an unprovoked assault on Ukrainian democracy by an autocratic imperial power. There is no other way to spin that, uh, although they try. And we can talk more about the justifications that uh, the Russian government is giving for this, if you'd like. <coughs> 
Mass casualties and refugee flows are already underway. The refugee flows now are over 600,000 people by conservative estimates, and that's likely to increase by several hundred thousand more if things go the way they're going in Ukrainian cities that right now. Uh, and uh, in terms of casualties, the estimates are probably really an understatement because we just don't know exactly right now what's going on in Kharkiv and Kiev and other cities which are being bombarded. Um, there is also the danger, and this cuts two ways, of escalation uh, to an all-out war between NATO, the West, and Russia. It cuts two ways because that does not necessarily tell us which strategy to adopt. That is, you know, should one be more forceful and try to stop Putin at this stage to prevent that escalation, or does one hold off, as the Biden administration has done to date, in saying no boots on the ground in Ukraine and certain actions wouldn't be taken for fear of es escalation. But for sure, it's on the agenda. Uh, none other than Fiona Hill, a former advisor in the Trump administration, said she could imagine uh, President Putin using nuclear weapons, which he's kind of hinted he would do, and then we're really in a different ballgame. So a lot of people want to know, uh, from the Russia domestic politics point of view, what is Putin's mindset? Seems to be a question on everyone's minds. Let me start by saying something I think is important for political scientists, but for the public as well. It really won't help us much to do what Americans often do, which is to go back and forth between the idea that the person is a rational actor or they're crazy. We like to do that in America because basically when we agree with leaders, we tend to think they're rational. When they stop agreeing with us in foreign policy, we resort often to the insanity argument. Saddam Hussein, you saw that kind of uh, dance take place. These are not analytic categories in these kinds of situations. What we want to do is figure out the person's worldview as best we can. And yes, that does mean getting in the person's head, but that isn't just a tea leaf reading exercise. It means if we know enough about the history and the culture and the background of the situation, there are better ways to analyze these these perceptions. In this context, I want to make the case I've made in several recent articles, which is the best way to understand Putin's Russia today is with an old category from the German sociologist, sociologist Max Weber, uh, which is he's a patrimonial leader, pure and simple, and here's the definition, which comes from Weber more or less in these terms in 1920. Uh, that this is ruled by self-aggrandizing men, he does use the gendered element uh, in 1920, who present themselves as the embodiment of the nation, demand personal loyalty, and run the state as a kind of family business. They give up parts of it to the loyalists. And as you can see from that definition, there are other leaders in the world today who fit the category. And that's part of our issue, is that there is something going on we call the global patrimonial wave. My co-author Jeff Kopstein and I have published about that. Putin, we argue, was the originator of that wave, but it obviously has spread much further to every part of the world. And that mindset is part of the reason we have the foreign policy decisions that we've seen in Russia today. So the goal Putin has at the moment is to rebuild not the Soviet Union. When you keep hearing people say he said the collapse of the USSR was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, he did say that. But in the most recent rhetoric, it's pretty clear what Putin wants is the old, mythical Russian Empire. I say mythical because his version of Russian history is, as I think our historians in the room will agree, uh, convoluted and uh, taken from nationalist playbooks that don't have a lot of fact behind them. Uh, but it is not anymore the Soviet system that he wants to build. In fact, he blamed Lenin, Stalin, and Khrushchev for the creation of modern Ukraine in a recent speech and said, if the Ukrainians want to have decommunization, we'll show them what that looks like, meaning the Russian Empire is back. So how did this guy get into power? Obviously, we have no time in 10 minutes to go through the whole story, but I do want to give you three steps that you can hopefully see are vital and kind of understand some of the drivers here. And my point with these three bullet points is that in each case, Putin's attitudes actually carried a lot of Russians along with him. Many people in Russian society had the same point of view earlier, which is one reason why he became so popular. Beginning with the collapse of the Soviet Union, which obviously we celebrated in the West as the end of the Cold War, as the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama once memorably put it, uh, Putin spent that period in East Germany. He did not spend his time in Gorbachev's Soviet Union, uh, which matters because he never really saw the effects of those reforms. He simply woke up basically one day in East Germany and said the Soviet Union's falling apart. We're supposed to now take apart the, the Berlin Wall and not do anything about it, and no one in Moscow seems to be answering my phone call. So his perception was the whole thing collapsed for no reason, and the West must be behind it because we were so excited to see it. There were a lot of Russians who agreed. 
a lot of Russians felt that this collapse was the end of their superpower status, the beginning of a long decline, and so Putin's nostalgia for the Soviet past and Russian imperial greatness were shared by many in that period. Not everybody, nothing is of course absolute. Then, in the 1990s, this kind of connection between Putin and the population of Russia built further because Putin spent his time getting more and more angry and resentful about what was called in Russia the wild 1990s, a period when Russia's GDP officially fell in about half, when uh, Boris Yeltsin was presiding over a very corrupt semi-democracy. The president himself was frequently drunk in personal uh, circumstances as well as public appearances. and. Uh, at the same time, we were giving wonderful advice to the Russian government about democratization in the market, which unfortunately made it look to a lot of Russians, actually a majority in public opinion polls by the end of the 90s, as if the United States were trying to weaken Russia with its terrible economic advice. Then in the 2000s, uh, the main goal of the Putin presidency was to rebuild what he called gasudarstvenus, which is an interesting Russian word, kind of means statehood, but it's sort of like loyalty to the state to build the Russian state so that it could do the things the Yeltsin regime couldn't and the Gorbachev couldn't, namely make Russia something like a power in the world again. And that too was pretty popular. It of course mattered that oil and gas prices skyrocketed in that decade and so lots of Russians experienced an economic boom along with the rhetoric. But it is fair to say that in the 2000s, Putin's popularity was very genuine because these three stages were, as I said before, kind of something people identified with in many parts of the society at a time when the United States and the West in general was pretty indifferent to Russia. Sometimes writing that Russia was finished, we no longer had to talk about it anymore, it's nothing more than a gas station with nuclear weapons, which is a phrase I would like to banish from all analytic conversations after today. And support for color revolutions, which I also would support, just to be clear, were perceived by the Putin administration as an effort to weaken Russia further in its state building project by encouraging democratic protest, civil society activism and the like, spreading to countries on Russia's borders. In the last decade, Putin's regime has hardened considerably. It was very authoritarian also in the earlier periods I just talked about. I don't want to you give you the impression it was a big democracy beforehand, but from 2011 on, it began to harden. First, these quote-unquote color revolutions made their way all the way to Moscow and to major Russian cities in the protests against the corrupt and uh, really quite awful elections for the Duma in 2011. That led to hundreds of thousands of Russians protesting in the streets. Putin uh, himself said, this must be Hillary Clinton's order. He said that publicly. And it began a process whereby Putin pulled back some of the more liberalizing elements that he had allowed in the previous period of his presidency, NGO organization, uh, some semi-democratic elections and the like. Things hardened much further after the, uh, fle the fleeing of President Yanukovych from Ukraine and the Eurodaimon revolution in Kiev and the rest of Ukraine in 2013-2014. That, of course, as you know, was followed by uh, Putin's uh, military invasion, which is what we should call it, of Donbass and the annexation of Crimea. Uh, from there, you see the rest of the kind of constitutional elements of Putin's order be stripped one by one, uh, to the point where now, what we used to call a kind of plebiscitarian patrimonialism, for those interested in, you know, kind of mouthfuls, uh, it is, it had some elements of the popular vote behind it, constitutional legal order. Putin used to refer to that all the time and say, look, I'm democratically elected. There's a law behind my, my rule. By the time you get to post-2014, which was kind of the apogee of Putin's popularity, most of that's been stripped away. The Constitution is now an entirely dead letter as of 2020's uh, reforms. Putin is president for life. Everyone in Russia knows it or just calls him Tsar. And uh, where we are today is, is really as close to pure patrimonialism as you could get. Incidentally, we thought that was a, something like an atavistic uh, element that you know old regimes uh, had patrimonialism, now in modern times we wouldn't have it. Turns out that was wrong. So this help, helps us hopefully understand this absolutely disastrous mistake. I wanna say it was a mistake as well as evil, so don't misunderstand me when I say it's a mistake. It's not like I think Putin was a great guy who made a mistake. I'm simply saying also for his own grip on power and clearly for Russia's future, this was a mistake in many, many ways. And I'll tell you the consequences on the next and final slide. First, a vast underestimation, clearly, of Ukrainian national solidarity and democracy. This is because Putin's image of Ukraine has built up over these years, as he put it many times, not really a country, 
a fake country, a puppet regime set up by the United States, and in a memorable quote just from a few days ago, he said, Ukrainians rise up and throw out President Zelensky because you're being held hostage by, quote, a band of drug addicts and neo-Nazis. This, of course, about a Jewish president democratically elected whose relatives fought against the Nazis uh, and some died in the Holocaust. So uh, clearly this notion in the ideology of Putin and his advisors that Ukraine was kind of an artifact of the Soviet Union and not really a country, they really believed that. And it's pretty clear they thought the entire regime would basically fold the moment there was any kind of threat, which of course we've seen is not the case at all. Ukrainians have been spending the last 30 years as an independent country. You can argue the roots go much later, uh, much further back than that, of course. But I want to emphasize for people who are 28 years old in you know, Ukraine today, their entire life has been in an independent country. So the idea this is simply an artificial creation of the Soviet past was always crazy. Sorry, I shouldn't use the word crazy, not an analytic concept. Second, uh, vast underestimation of Western NATO solidarity. Um, I do believe that Putin and his advisors thought that the heyday of Western solidarity and transatlantic in alliance was, was dead, that after Trump and Biden, uh, you could argue the United States had retreated from the world scene, Merkel was gone, so maybe Germany wouldn't uh, be able to resist, Macron had his own direct line to the in France to the Kremlin, maybe he could be persuaded to break apart Brexit's weakened solidarity with UK. You could see the argument being constructed, all we have to do is push. Not only will Ukraine collapse, but the West will collapse too. What a wonderful victory for Russia if both those things happen. Clearly, totally wrong. And then the bite of Western sanctions. Everyone said, well, Russia's got huge foreign uh, reserves, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars ready to be spent, and you know, they're used to sanctions now. It's always a joke. The you know, oligarchs find ways around it. These are different kinds of sanctions, and they are hitting very, very hard at every level of Russian society, from ordinary people who can no longer necessarily get cash out of ATMs, terrible inflation of the ruble, but then also the oligarchs and uh, advisors to Putin who are personally sanctioned and can no longer travel on, on flights. That's really important for a regime that relied on people going to ski in the Alps and you know, have good times on islands uh, when they weren't serving the leader. So you put that all together in the last element, this is an echo chamber. Authoritarian regimes are frequently prone to this phenomenon when they get no evidence from anybody outside the six or seven people who can meet and all of them say, yes, dear President Putin, wonderful leader, you know, you're right about Ukraine, you're right about the West, it's very decrepit, please push, we're ready for sanctions and no one can contradict because bad things happen to those who contradict these kinds of leaders and uh, one minute is left. And uh, then let's add the, the COVID uh, element, that because Putin has been clearly quite terrified of this, um, you see the long tables he meets people at. So even less likely that any dissenting voice would be heard. This is the last slide, so I'm not too far over. So here are the, the four uh, scenarios that we can imagine. I'm gonna put the first one first. Although we've said it's unlikely because Russian firepower is clearly superior to Ukrainian and the number of troops, you know, the population difference, all of those things should lead, according to most IR theory, to a Russian, sadly, Russian defeat. But you know, this has been so bungled and mismanaged, you should, cer certainly shouldn't assume uh, this convoy of some 40 miles of uh, tanks and uh, troops ready to come to Kiev, at least one argument, and the Pentagon made it today, is that some Russian soldiers are so unwilling to kill their Slavic brethren that they've emptied their own gas tanks to block the tanks back, so that's why it's stuck. Admittedly, only one argument. Others just say it's the beginning of an encirclement and a terrible, bloody siege. But I do want to say it's possible Ukraine will win. Second, much more likely and more horrible is a long and bloody occupation. It will not be an occupation that's peaceful. Already we can see Ukraine will fight and fight forever, as long as that kind of regime is in place. I can't even see a puppet regime of the Lukashenko type being installed because there would be nobody really around Kiev to support such a regime, or very few. Uh, along with that, of course, the Russian opposition would have to be crushed as well, because to do the occupation, you also have to silence any voice in the Russian Federation who would oppose, and those brave people um, in Russia who are protesting by the thousands uh, would be in for a bleak future. But then, to be more optimistic in a way about the end of this talk, um, scenarios three and four. It is conceivable that this pure patrimonial regime with its incompetence, its you know, venality, its corruption, and then its disastrous mistake will fall. And that could happen in we'll, the two ways I identify here. So one is, one of the generals says, you know, I'm not marching on Kiev, I'm marching on Moscow. I'm gonna take my troops and go the other direction. There is precedent in Russian history. 
Cornille did this in 1917. It's a different situation, I understand. But uh, there is the possibility that there will be a coup attempt of some sort. Even if it didn't succeed, it would weaken the regime considerably. Others, oligarchs, you know, people who are not so happy with this might join in such a rebellion, and it would be a very interesting thing. The other, of course, is that the sanctions and anger at this regime might lead to some serious popular uprisings. They're already there, but much more extensive, much more widespread. We have seen protests against the Putin regime in the Russian Far East, uh, against particular acts of corruption, against disastrous fires and the like. So that could be galvanized uh, in the future. The key to Western success, then, in any of these scenarios is for us to remember why we're able to contain this at all, and that is the solidarity that the entire West has shown in a remarkable way that has to be sustained in what could be some really turbulent times ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Our next speaker is Amy Oakes. Uh, Amy is a professor in the government department, and she's the co-director of the Project on International Peace and Security, known as PIPS. She's written a path-breaking book on diversionary war and numerous academic and public-facing articles on issues related to international security and U.S. foreign policy. Amy's current book project looks at how the United States can make positive inducements to adversaries more credible. That seems quite timely. Amy? This is, gonna, this is on. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm delighted to be included, especially as I am not an expert on Russia. Um, so this is going to be something, you know, you know th there's like a line from a children's program and now for something completely different. Isn't there a TV show where they say that? Anyway, it's, I think it's us. I think we're only the only people, we're the only people up here who are going to get that joke. Anyway, um, I am not talking about Russia particularly um, in my presentation. Um, as you will see here from my title, um, I am focusing on the future of American credibility and the fate of NATO. As a result of the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, and that's because I'm, um, I'm a security person. Um, and my job, I see it, is to try to think of all the bad things that can happen in the world. Like, how can things go wrong? And then try to anticipate ways to prevent them from happening. Um, this actually led to an, one of my favorite experiences. I was, I was invited to give a talk at the League of Women Voters, or if you're familiar with the organization, and they asked me to give an informational talk on the utility of sanctions for preventing nuclear proliferation. So I, I prepared like crazy. I gave the speech. The first question that was asked of me by an audience member was, why was your talk so depressing? So anyway, you've been warned. Um, <laughs> I've been following events um, in, in Ukraine and, and Russia very closely, primarily because I've been studying great power conflict my entire career, um, great power war, and I've actually never lived through one um, or had a serious prospect of one. So this is a really big moment um, for me. So I've been following it really closely. And what I've noticed is that a lot of the, the media coverage, and the political analysis, and the talking heads, they're focused on an, a pretty narrow set of questions so far, which I think is appropriate because we're in early days. But they focus on things like Putin, uh, Putin's motivation and state of mind, the potential rising domestic discontent with Putin's foreign policy due to both economic costs of sanctions, as well as the fact that uh, Russians have family and friends living in Ukraine. And I read an article the other day that was talking about the concern of cousins fighting cousins. Um, and then also just the focus on the surprisingly stiff resistance put up by Ukrainian forces as well as um, civilian volunteers. But largely what's missing from this analysis that I've seen so far um, is a conversation about the conflict's medium and long-term implications, um, and what they are, their implications for U.S. credibility, and uh, credibility as a global leader, and NATO's future as a key pillar of the liberal order. So mostly we're, and, and this is totally normal, we're focusing on the now, but I wanna look six months down the road. That's my timeline. Um, my, fear 
is that if Professor Hansen's scenario two happens, which means that the war drags on, sanctions drag on, we are going to see that American credibility as a global leader and NATO's role as a pillar of the liberal order are dramatically weakened. They're dramatically weakened. Um, so I think about it in terms of, so you know, we have six months, right? Think, think six months from now, and we're still trying to impose sanctions on Russia, and they're not working, right? They're not making concessions. So that means that we're essentially in a game of chicken, right? Sanctions are essentially a game of chicken. Who's going to give up first, right? For whom is the, are the costs going to be too high that they're going to make concessions? I think a lot of the focus is on Russia and whether Russia, I mean, because they're brutal, the sanctions, immediately have been brutal. But I actually um, think that the, you know, if we're using, continuing to use the metaphor of the, of, of the game of chicken, I actually think that the side that's going to, that may very well swerve first is not Europeans, European members of NATO, it's the United States. I think we're the weak link. Yeah. So I told you, I warned you, I said, my talks are depressing. OK. So the first thing I want to point out, first thing I want to point out here, oh, you should notice my name. Did you notice my name? Amy Negative Nelly Oak. OK, here we go. The first thing that I want to point out is that the West is celebrating too soon. These are early days, early days. Um, yeah, they're sure, there have been, there've been successes, right? Um, so uh, for example, I think the Biden administration and allied release of intelligence, Brit especially British intelligence, to defang the Russian information, to defang Russian information warfare has been very successful and actually it was surprising to me as a strategy for combating Russian disinformation and, and that, so that's good. Um, we have seen NATO uh, cooperation and cohesion. I'm especially surprised and delighted by Germany's willingness to accept major economic costs by halting um, the implementation of Nord Stream 2, right? So these are all successes. Uh, the swiftness with which Russia has experienced sanctions um, and Russia's rather embarrassing um, initial military performance it turns out that they cannot fight at night. And it's very embarrassing. <laughs> like embarrassing. I mean, it is. It's embarrassing, especially given that they've been touting their military modernization program. Um, what I would like to point out is that while we have these initial signs of success, what they are essentially doing is papering over deep cracks in the transatlantic relationship. This is, temp <laughs> this is temporary. I, I think this is largely going to be temporary, right? So in the moment of crisis, we're willing to put aside the sources of disagreement, but it is not a foregone conclusion that that will continue, af continue beyond this crisis. Um, you know, the, the wild, foreign policy swings that we've seen in U.S. foreign policy over the last three administrations has really eroded confidence globally, but especially in NATO and EU member states, in Washington as a reliable security partner. Um, so for Europe, even though these are great signs, for Europe, the jury is really still out on whether the United States is going to remain a leader in NATO or even a reliable partner in maintaining the liberal order. Um, if the US fails to withstand the sanctions, right? If it fails to withstand the sanctions, Washington swerves first in our game of chicken. American credibility in foreign policy will suffer which will in turn deal 
a major potential, I'm not, I'm not going to go that far, that's too strong. I'm going to say a major blow to NATO's future influence. All right, here we go. This is why I think the United States is the weak link. It can, I have some suggestions, so it's not all bad news, but this is why we're the weak link. I read an article in ABC News today that said that, that the economic cost of the sanctions to the United States would be negligible. I don't think that's accurate. I think that's sure, probably true in the short term, but not if we're talking about six to six months to a year long to two year long sanctions. Um, so when we're talking about the cost, obviously we're already seeing rising oil prices. Right now, the average nationally is about $4. But think six months from now. You're going to the pump, and you're paying six, seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon for gas with no end in sight. The other thing which hasn't got as much attention is the effect. So uh, Russia is a major exporter of grain, which now has been interrupted, which is going to cause rising food prices globally. It's going to affect the United States as well which means that we're going to start having rising food prices. This is in a country that's already reeling from rising inflation. OK, so that's that. And just as an aside, this is something that's just occurred to me. We are not, the United States right now, Americans, are not in the mood to sacrifice for the public good, not even for other Americans. What makes you think that Americans are going to sacrifice in terms of paying higher prices for food, not able to fill their car with gas. What do you think, what makes you think that they're going to pay those costs for people in a country about which they know nothing? Most of us were first introduced to Ukraine playing the board game Risk. So I would just like to add that as a side point. I, we are just this is a moment in which Americans are not prepared to make sacrifices for Ukraine, even if you sell it as perfect protecting global democracy. It's just not a winning argument right now. Now, to be fair, lots of countries face both of these issues, right? European states are facing costs. They're also weary of COVID. So the United States is not unique in that sense. So now I'm going to bring out the thing that makes me, that makes the United States different and more, and its future trajectory more dangerous. You ready? This is a thing I've been worried about now for years. This is actually the source of my book. Polarization. Most of this discussion of polarization is focused on its effect on American domestic politics, but I have news for you. Polarization and hyperpartisanship is now affecting American foreign policy. This is a dramatic departure from the past. Um, so, it, for example, to just to illustrate how polar how foreign policy has become increasingly partisan. If I tell you that I think that China is a greater supplier of, Russia, of, of disinformation than Russia, can you predict which party I vote for? Who do I vote for? Republicans. It never used to be that way. You could never, it was really hard to predict how people voted based on their foreign policy views. That is no longer the case. Right? The, the polarization, um, the extreme divide, the belief that your opponents are not just wrong, but evil, which has permeated domestic politics, is now being found in foreign policy. And that should scare you. That should scare you. That's extremely um, alarming. So. Um, you know, you think, you know, if, if um, casting foreign policy as a partisan issue 
um, you know, increases your chances of turning that into an electoral victory, right? So I sell this issue as, as a partisan issue, right? And I say, and I can use that to win votes in the next election. By the way, oops, by the way, when are the midterms? In the fall, y'all. Do you think it's lost on anyone? that this is a moment to use foreign policy to win electoral votes? No way. I mean, this is like exactly what's happening. Here are two recent articles that illustrate how Republicans are, be are beginning to politicize the Ukraine-Russia issue. And I just want you to know that I am not being partisan. The Democrats are doing it too, right? They are beginning to link this. They're beginning to link this issue with um, with Trump's impeachment scenario and the impeachment, and using this as an extra opportunity to critique Clinton. Uh, uh, sorry, to to to, cri to critique Trump. No one escapes. Everyone is engaging in the same behavior because everyone's facing the same incentives created by hyper, by hyper polarization. This, this is concerning. This is very, con I mean, it's concerning to me. It actually keeps me up at night. Now, I will say this. I have happy news. Happy news for me may not actually be happy news for you. You may view it as neutral. I think it's happy. <laughs> Here we go. Here's what Bi the Biden administration should do. Okay. And he should do it tonight. That's why I'm really excited to be talking about this, because tonight is Biden's first State of the Union address, and this is what he needs to do. The Biden, and I know, I'm a total mess, okay, right now. I'm normally, am I normally like this? No, it's, it's, I'm, okay. <laughs> it is a heavy time. Do you find that the only thing you can talk about right now is Ukraine? Okay. Anyway, here's my, here's my advice. Um, the Biden administration still has a moment to shape the U.S. domestic narrative, but he needs to turn his gaze homeward. The focus has been entirely on Europe, maintaining the NATO alliance, countering Rus Russian foreign policy. I talk, oh, you know what the problem is? I talk with my hands. I'm, an it I'm partly Italian. This is really hard for me. I never discovered, <laughs> sorry, this is a moment of self-reflection. Okay, because I really want to talk, but I can't. Okay, anyway, so, <laughs> um, so he needs to turn his gaze homeward, and he needs to turn it homeward now. Now, um, obviously, he needs to be starting to work towards creating a bipartisan coalition among political elites, convincing both Democrats and Republicans to start rolling back that hyperpartisan rhetoric to create consensus behind um, the foreign, uh, behind Biden's foreign policy. There's also um, a moment. Now, I'm one of those. I'm one of those people. Oh, so the other thing he needs to do is not just try to create a bipartisan moment. He also needs to not lie to the American people tonight. There's a huge temptation. I know. Sorry. There's a huge temptation to undersell the cost of use of of, of foreign policy. He's going to be tempted to say it won't be that hard. But what he needs to do is give a Churchillian speech where he promises nothing but blood, sweat, toil, and tears, and get ready for it for the next six months. Because doing anything else is going to make it harder to maintain U.S. involvement in the sanctions. The last thing I want to say is that there's a moment. OK, so I'm one of those, face, I'm one of those Facebook people who has a Facebook friend group that's divided equally between Republicans and Democrats. I might be the only American left. Um, and not only are my Republican and Facebook friends uh, Republicans, they are mostly Trump supporters as well. I, for you, looked at every single one of their pages. And they're all politically active, by the way. 
I went in and I looked at every single page and what they've been posting. Do you know what they're posting? Nothing. Two-thirds of them have posted nothing. One-third have posted uh, things on praying for Ukraine with no criticism of Putin. And I've now gotten a piece of Russian disinformation from my mother on Instagram. So what I'm saying is there's a vacuum that can be filled by the Biden administration. Because if he doesn't act now, he, did, he doesn't act now, that space is going to be filled by partisan, hyper-partisan rhetoric and Russian disinformation. The end. Thank you, Amy. Um, our, next, our next speaker is Lincoln Zaleski. Z Lincoln is a junior program manager at ADATA. He graduated from William & Mary in 2020 with a major in international relations. He wrote a PIPS white paper developing a framework to combat authoritarian disinformation campaigns. He's currently working on research funded by USAID that explores Russian influence in Eastern Europe through the media and through information operations. Take it away, Lincoln. Great. On? Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Mike. I want to start actually by giving a, a quick anecdote about uh, Amy Oakes and her negativity. Uh, in it is. It is a nice story. Uh, in, in December 2019, um, we were all sitting around having a conversation in a PIPS meeting, um, and we were talking about uh, a small little virus uh, in December 2019 called coronavirus. Um, probably somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 people in China had it at the time. And Amy Oakes turns to all of us and goes, we're all going to get this, and it's going to shut down the world. And we all laughed at her, and we were like, that's ridiculous. There's not a chance that's going to happen. 5,000 people in China have this. There's no way. Um, and her negativity was right, so it's worth listening to. Exactly. Um, so I am here to let's skip off. Uh, I am here to talk about uh, aid data research, um, specifically some research that we've been doing for the past two years, so way before uh, the Russian invasion, that has suddenly become uh, incredibly relevant uh, to what we're talking about today. So aid data has been tracking Russian state-owned media mentions of civil society organizations in former communist non-European Union countries in Europe from 2015 to 2021. So in short, we've been looking at Russian propaganda for the last six years, um, specifically focused in the civil society of all of these countries on the board. Um, and this graph shows every time a Russian state-owned media outlet mentioned a civil society organization over this time frame divided by country. So for some of the countries that not a lot happened that Russia cared about, uh, like Albania and Bosnia and Herzegovina, not a ton of mentions, and countries where a lot of stuff happened, like Belarus or Georgia or Moldova, there were a good number of mentions, over a thousand in some cases. And then all the way on your right, you have Ukraine, which is six times more mentions than any other country. And that shows that Russia has cared very deeply about what goes on in Ukraine for the entire measured time frame. This is not a new thing that Russia has been talking about Ukraine, that Russia has been promoting propaganda. This has been going on for a while. And not only this, but it has been remarkably consistent over the entire time frame. So these are those same number of mentions spread out uh, from when they were mentioned. So 2015 all the way to 2021. And we'd expect you know, these spike around certain, particular, certain events. So the, we have the invasion of Donbass had a number of spikes, uh, the same time of invasion of Crimea, the Maidan revolution is going on and starting to end up. So that's when the spikes in 2015 are occurring. And then we'd imagine that they kind of taper off. Stuff starts to cool down a little bit in Ukraine, the war starts to get old, um, and most news sources stop covering Ukraine, but not Russian state-owned media. They continue on in 2016 and 2017, 2018, 2019. They dip a little bit in 2020 and then right back up at the end in 2021 there. So Russia cares about Ukraine. They've been talking about it for the entire time period nonstop. And not only have they been talking about it a lot, but they've been talking about it incredibly negatively. So these blue uh, lines represent negative mentions. This is Ukraine here on the bottom. The dark blue is extremely negative mentions and the light blue is somewhat negative. Over 80% of the non-neutral mentions of Russian state-owned media in Ukraine 
whether they talk about Ukrainian civil society, protesters, uh, political parties, media organizations, is negative. They talk about them in an incredibly negative light. So basically, our, Russia, our, our research says that Russia talks about Ukraine a lot in their state-owned media, and when they do talk about Ukraine and Ukrainian society, it's largely negative. And so this begs the question, what are the actual narratives that Russia is promoting in Ukraine? What are they talking about so negatively? Um, and so first, it's important uh, from my research on disinformation t campaigns to kind of talk about what the goal of them are, is. Um, so Russia, when they're starting off an information campaign, they're trying to target an audience. They're trying to find someone that they can pinpoint and drill home a narrative to. Um, and the, the purpose of this is a number of reasons. First, it creates proxy spreaders. Uh, and that creates the narrative to spread further. You have people who start to believe the lie and they'll go and tell their friends about it and go and share it on Facebook and go and share it on Twitter and that spreads it further and further. And it also muddies the source of it. People don't know that it's Russian disinformation if your friend is telling you about it. it there's no way to determine it. And lastly, it polarizes the community. It tells the, it, it divides it between the people that believe the lie and those that don't. And they, they're like, well, if you don't believe this, then you know, we can't be friends, we can't have a civil conversation. It splits the community. And so that's why you need domestic actors on the ground to believe the lie. And Russia, and we'll see this in the narratives as I, as I talk about it further, uh, Russia decided to target around ethnic and linguistic ties in Ukraine. So they targeted ethnic Russians and they targeted Russian-speaking Ukrainians that identified as Russian or closer to Russia or had ties to Russia in some way. And you can see this pretty plainly in the narratives. Oh, this didn't come through great, but that's okay. Um, Russia promoted, the first narrative, is that Russia promoted far-right fascists and Nazis have taken over Kiev. And uh, Professor Hansen has already talked about that, um, how Kiev is being uh, overrun by Nazis, according to Russian propaganda. And so this, uh, this table, if it showed up, uh, would show a whole number of organizations and the number of times that they were mentioned. And the third highest set of mentions in Russian propaganda sources in Ukraine was nationalist paramilitary groups. And these are very similar kinds of organizations to what we see in the United States. So think about uh, organizations that showed up for January 6th or organizations that showed up uh, in Charlottesville, those kinds of organizations. So they're dangerous. They're not good news for Ukraine and they do exist. It's not that Russia is fully lying about them. What they are lying about, though, is how far these organizations have penetrated Ukrainian society. According to Russia, um, nationalist paramilitary groups uh, control Kiev and the government and basically have implemented policies that are anti-Russian, um, going as far as to beat and arrest people for speaking in Russian, uh, kill Russians just for being in the country, um, a whole bunch of horrific stuff that really has not happened in Ukraine at all, or is not, at least not as badly as the Russians make it out to be. So here are, and I cherry-picked some examples for you, some headlines over the entire period. In 2015, they talk about the rise of neo-Nazism in Ukraine post-Maidan. Uh, they also talk about it in 2017. They say that the veterans of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion and the right sector group uh, make up Ukrainian civic activists. And best of all, Yesterday, they decided to also talk about it, uh, which was fun for me to find. Um, that the latter, the, they're talking about the West, and they say that Ukra the Ukrainian military has support from neo-Nazi militias. And so basically, the Ukrainian government has been overrun with Nazis, uh, and this is really bad for Russians and Russian speakers because they are out to get you. And that leads us right into our next narrative, which is that Russians and Russian speakers are under attack in Ukraine. Um, these are, uh, again, another set of headlines that I just decided to, um, to cherry pick here. Excuse me. Um, so basically it follows from the first set that because fascists and Nazis are in power in Kiev, Russians and Russian speakers are discriminated against and under attack in Ukraine. And this narrative, once again, continues throughout the period. We have headlines from 2015, 2020, 2021. And um, because of this, we need Russian help. We need the Russian government to come in and be the savior and save all these Russian people that are being killed by Nazis in Ukraine. That's the narrative that the Russians are pushing. So basically, 
what, what I'm describing is Russia bombards Ukrainians, in particular Russians and Russian speakers, with narratives that they're under attack, they're highly threatened by a nationalist fascist government, and they need Russia to save them. So how, how did they do? How did the Russian government actually end up faring? How successful were they in creating a fifth column of Ukrainians? Well here, in March 2021, IRI released a public opinion poll where they basically asked a question. Um, and for context, the majority of Russian speakers, the group that was targeted, live in South and Eastern Ukraine. And the population of Ukrainian government institutions was at an all-time low during this period. So theoretically, there should be a lot of support for regime change. They've been bombarded for six years with disinformation. The support for Ukrainian institutions is at an all-time low. And theoretically, they should be really scared of Nazis in Ukraine. And yet we see in the most Russian-speaking regions, the South and the East, support for the Donbass going to Russia is only 3% and 5% respectively. And in Crimea, it's only 5% and 6%. So basically, Russians aren't any more, or Russians and Russian speakers in Ukraine aren't any more likely to support Crimea and Donbass becoming part of Russia. They don't support an invasion. They don't support Russian parts of Ukraine joining Russia. And so largely, the disinformation campaign has failed. The information isn't successful, and they, the Russians have largely spent six years building a campaign that hasn't managed to change any support at all. And so, this begs the question, why? Why did this fail? I mean, the Russians have been so successful in their disinformation campaigns in the United States, in Spain, in the United Kingdom. Why did this fail? Um, and I have three reasons. I think there are a number of reasons, but I have three main ones that I think are key. First, uh, research, research shows that countries with a high degree of disinformation that experience it every single day have a population that can more easily identify it. They are exposed to it so often alongside independent media sources that are unbiased that they can look at the two and say, oh, that's disinformation, and that's not. And so over time, the longer that a disinformation campaign takes, the less likely it is to be effective in the sense that people are able to identify it better. So you gotta be even sneakier with the way they're going about it, and the Russians weren't able to do that. Second of all, the Ukrainian government actually did a pretty good job during this time frame. They shut down pro-Russian outlets. They shut down pro-Russian oligarchs. They arrested and exiled people like Viktor Medvedchuk and people like Viktor Yanukovych. Um, and people who are sympathetic to a pro-Russian Putin regime in the country. They isolated people, they um, arrested and exiled individuals. Oh man, falling apart, bad day for all of us. Just like your mentor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and lastly, and arguably most importantly, Putin picked a really poor narrative. Uh, even as the most staunch Russian or most staunch Russian speaker, most staunch ethnic Russian super nationalist, if you walk down the street in any Ukrainian city, it is extremely unlikely that you would be attacked by a Nazi. And people know this. And <laughs> Zelensky doesn't feel like a Nazi. Poroshenko didn't feel like a Nazi. And ultimately, it seemed ridiculous to most people that the Ukrainian regime was taken over by a, a neo-Nazi party and controlled by a puppet regime. The, the narrative just didn't work. It didn't make a lot of sense to people in the country. And so ultimately, because of these three reasons, uh, people, people in Ukraine being more resilient, people in Ukraine not believing the lie, and uh, the Ukrainian government doing a good job shutting down the people who promote the disinformation within the country, ultimately the disinformation campaign has largely failed. Um, so yeah, Great. thank you. Thanks, Lincoln. Okay, I'm just gonna take a few minutes, ask a few questions of the panelists, and they, I'll give them a, a moment if they want to uh, ask each other some questions, and then we're gonna open it up to you. Um, so I guess I have one question for each of you, but then you can ignore it if you want. You can, you can answer someone else's question if you'd like, and then I'll ask a, a single question for the whole panel. So this, the first one I think is for Amy Oaks, uh, uh, but anyone can answer it. So we've, at least I've been hearing a lot on the news that certain military actions by the United States or by its allies would be very likely to cause the war to spread 
to, you know, outside the borders of Ukraine, or to escalate. So things that people have been talking about are no-fly zones, troops on the ground, flying fighters and delivering them to Ukrainian air bases. All these things risk direct military conflict between Russian forces and uh, Western or US forces. Um, so I'm interested to know what your biggest concern is in terms of military escalation. But I'm also interested to, to hear what you all have to say about cyber. So there was a lot of discussion in the four or five days before the war started about how Russia was going to launch a cyber attack and then the West was going to respond and this could lead to escalation. But so far anyway, I don't think we've seen a lot of claims by either side that this is an act of war. If you launch this cyber attack, we will do X. So I'd love to hear about military escalation and then cyber escalation if you're interested. Um, uh, second question is uh, more focused, I, I think this is for mostly for, uh, for Lincoln. So if Russia was unsuccessful in its sort of strategic communications, its, its information campaigns, um, anecdotally it appears the Ukrainians have been wildly successful, at least in the last five or six days. Uh, at least folks in the United States think that Zelensky and his government have been very effective. So. I, I know that you're, you're focused mainly on Russia, but I do w wonder if you could give us your thoughts on why the Ukrainians have been so successful, or question my premise. Maybe they haven't been successful with the, the audiences um, that, they're that they're targeting. Um, and then I guess the last, the last question I have is for, is for Steve. I'd love to hear you reflect on some of the, on the argument that, that Lincoln made, right? So, you talked a lot in your presentation, Steve, about the possibility of, you know, sort of either revolution from below or defections from wi within the regime. I do, it sounds like folks weren't believing the propaganda. Are there other sources of power that are stronger in Russia? And who ultimately has the authority to remove Putin? Other than, other than voters in, a, in an election. So those are the substantive questions. Each of you feel free to talk about whatever you want. Steve, you wanna go first? Oh, you can go third, no, I don't I'll, care. I'm happy to do it, of course. Uh, so first of all, as a scenario, it's plausible these kinds of uprisings or coup attempts would happen, but it's only a scenario. There's a big part of the Russian population that a lot like people who were per, you know, consumers of disinformation in this country only watch their favorite news source, which repeats it all the time. They're rural. They may be very traditional in their cultural orientations and therefore not like the kinds of Western freedoms, you know, li literally, that, that would be uh, you know, more likely under a democratic regime. So while they may not buy the entirety of the story of the neo-Nazis and drug addicts taking over Ukraine, they might have a vague sense that Ukraine is really a problem and that Russia has a right to solve it. Uh, and those who haven't got their relatives over the border, and that's certainly plenty of people in a country of 140 million people, uh, you know, they're going to be w relatively supportive of this because they got no information that tells them otherwise. Even the economic crisis for them may just be something they blame on the West and are willing to live through as they've lived through hardship in the past. So, you know, this would be the sources of stability for Putin's regime, which are definitely there. Having said that, the younger generation in particular, but others too, are, until very recently, um, consumers of a fairly open internet compared to China. So it's changed a lot in the last year and a half or so. But prior to that, you could turn on Navalny's videos and 100 million views took place of Putin's palace on the uh, Black Sea, which has pretty good evidence behind it that it is Putin's palace, you know, which has like huge buildings everywhere with every possible marble fountain and, you know, insane luxury and, people do understand that the regime has siphoned off a lot of money. You'll hear that from the same Russians who sometimes support conservative points of view. They also know that they're all thieves up in the Kremlin and steal. Sometimes people dissociate that from Putin himself, but you know, it's not necessarily the case that uh, you know, everyone would just buy the notion that Putin is a czar and a good person and is defending them. I'm convinced that there's more unrest there for, and I'll be quick here, just for a couple of really key reasons. One is body bags coming over the border. That have not been the case in the previous interventions much. And even when it started to happen in 2014 and after, it had a profound effect on Russian public opinion already. If the 
you know, unfortunately, the casualties and deaths are so much greater this time. I think that's going to have a cascading effect because it doesn't really fit with what Putin's image has been, a force of stability and, and state building. So that's one key factor. Uh, and then, you know, the other one is the uh, elite that have propped him up and kept this connection with the West as a sort of, uh, as, a, as an escape valve for pressure. Now that escape valve's gone. It's an old book called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty for the political scientists in the room. When you cut off exit, you got to either get loyalty or you get unrest. And I think that, you know, escape valve is now being shut. Great. Amy, can you talk to us either about escalation or about the spread of conflict? Um, yeah. I, can I just clarify your the first half of your question real oh, quick. You can just revisit my question in any way you want and answer okay. whatever you want. I think the United States is, and its allies are doing everything they can to prevent the NATO from being responsible for escalating the conflict. Um, from you know re refusing to um, maintain a no-fly zone, which would bring them in direct confrontation with, with Russian um, forces. Um, they, I think, most striking and was when Putin went uh, put his uh, nuclear forces on high alert. Biden did something r kind of remarkable, which is that he didn't respond, and that was actually a pretty brave decision, um, both for security reasons because he could have misinterpreted. What you know, what Putin was actually trying to do. Um, so you know, there's that reason as well. But then I think also, um, you know, just the the concern about what that would mean, you know, f for the American domestic political audience as well. But mostly, I think the concern was like, I'm not gonna, I am not gonna rise to your bait. What you want is for me to respond by going to DEFCON three. You want American m nuclear missiles loaded onto planes. You want these silos to be, you know, um, you know, ready for action. And and Putin said no. And that's cost. That was potentially costly. He could have been critiqued by Republicans. He could have been critiqued by Democrat hawks. It could have been unpopular domestically. I mean, there's all kinds of costs associated with that. But that to me shows that was a costly signal that he is uninterested and having the United States or NATO be responsible for escalation. Um, I talked to Sue Peterson the other day, who also thinks terrible and pessimistic things about the world. So we had a great conversation. <laughs> um, her concern, and, I, and I'm, I'm still um, um, chewing it over, so I'm not entirely sure I agree. She sees the first target as Moldova. Um, and that, of course, depends to some extent on how things progress in Ukraine. But Moldova is the low-hanging fruit. It's not a member of NATO. It's already, I mean, it's not going to become a member of, of any kind of, of the EU or NATO because it has a contested territory. Um, and so it, and Russians see it as part of their historic territory. So um, I actually, if I were to make a prediction about what's next, I'm hoping this is, I would really, really love to be wrong on this one. But if we're going to see escalation because Putin starts seeing things going well on the ground in Ukraine and says, let's make an easy gain in Moldova. Got it. Lincoln, uh, Ukrainian information games? Yeah, sure. Happy to talk about it. So um, one thing that I, I want to caveat is um, Ukraine is definitely not playing the same game that we see in normal information uh, campaigns follow. So when we think of, you know, a disinformation campaign or a strong information nationalistic campaign, we think about, uh, you know, China's 50 cent army or, you know, Russian troll farms or some sort of state-backed propagandistic campaign. Um, I think Zelensky's doing a very good job in uh, broadcasting his, his strength and his support on his own personal social media, and that's being backed up by a lot of, you know, uh, other Ukrainian media sources, but it's not nearly to the same scale. I actually think the support for the Ukrainians um, comes from two sources. First of all, I think a lot of it comes from the United States. Uh, I think the fact that we were able to say, hey, these disinformation campaigns, here's what the Russians are going to do before they actually do it, um, allowed a lot of Americans and people around the world to, say, to see, oh, this is what Russia will say, this is what they have been doing, and it made Ukraine look like the victim, and people tend to support the victims in, in conflicts. 
Um, the other thing, too, is when we look at countries like Kenya and um, countries who were formerly under imperialistic regimes, uh, their response to Ukraine was incredibly powerful at the UN. Um, and they're saying things along the lines of w the same thing happened to us, uh, whatever it was, 100, 200 years ago, um, and we recognize exactly what this is and we support you 100%. And that's not because of Ukrainian information in Kenya, mm -hmm. that's because this is such a known trope and a known idea throughout the world that every single country who has been taken over by another bigger, stronger power knows exactly what this is like and is incredibly supportive of Ukraine. That, that would be my guess. It's, it's not a concerted effort, it's actually the fact that uh, countries know what this is like and know what it feels like and, and finds it, um, fi find the, the Ukrainian resilience um, great and strong and, and yeah. Okay, last question from me, um, and I hope this leads somewhere um, in the future. So if we held a panel discussion like this one week from now and you were not up here, but instead you were out in the audience what are the types of people that you would like to see up here in a panel discussion on this topic, on the causes and effects of the war in Ukraine? Um, we ha have a very GRI-centric panel up here. It's very political science heavy, but there are a lot of people in our community that know an awful lot about Russia, Ukraine, U.S. foreign policy, and you know they know a lot about wars and refugee flows. So, yeah, so my question to the panelists is, what type of people would you like to see up here next week if we did this again? Well, I, I'm gonna make the obvious point, which is we have a really great Russia post-Soviet program at William & Mary. I see many of the members here uh, and students as well. So, uh, although I am a member of that program and proud of it, so I, I'm sort of representing, but I'm definitely not the only representative, so that would be uh, one, one area. And of course, you know, Mike, uh, ever since I arrived, I'm a big area specialist, always have been, always will be. Uh, there's some insights you get from people on the ground and people from the culture that you can't get from the Western analysts. Good, thanks. Um, go ahead, Mike. I was actually going to say something similar to Steve. Um, well, I was I was not on a panel. I was listening to a panel the other day, um, and it was two disinformation specialists and someone on the ground in Ukraine um, who runs a, a civil advocacy NGO. Um, and the on-the-ground NGO perspective of what's going on in Ukraine is incredibly interesting. The other thing I, I think might be interesting is some sort of um, sociology perspective that talks about where Ukrainian nationalism comes from. I'm Armenian. Armenians have a lot of nationalism, but I have been shocked at how staunch Ukrainians have been in, in remaining in the country and support from the diaspora and all, all those kinds of things. So that would be incredibly interesting to hear about. I'd like to hear that too. Amy? Okay, so those are the, these are the two things I want to know, one of which Lincoln could actually answer potentially for me tonight. So, What I want to know is, is Russia actually, is Russia so distracted by what's going on in Ukraine and, and internally that it's not focusing right now on a disinformation campaign targeted at the U.S.? I want, so that's the first question. The second question is, I want someone to make an argument for how NATO survives this while still having Im significant influence in its traditional area of responsibility. Its job is to prevent great power war, and it has been reduced to meaningless, unending conversations in a body that may has zero decision-making power. So what I really want to hear is from someone who's going to talk about these other security institutions and what their future looks like um, after the end of the war. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rebecca, do we have a plan for questions from the audience? Yeah, you're going to call on people. Okay, I'm going to call on people. And we're going to run microphones around. And we're going to run microphones around. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take, well, can Lincoln, can you give her your microphone? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm going to take two or three questions at the same time and then let the Panelists, pick the ones that they want to answer. Do me a favor, raise your hand. Uh, go ahead up with the microphone. Raise your hand, and uh, I'll identify you. When you stand up, tell us who your name. Tell us your name, and tell us you know what you're about. You're a student at William and Mary. You're a member of the community. Whatever, and then briefly state a clear question. Okay. Okay. 
So first, this guy right here in the green and gold, Rebecca, right here. He's one. And two, the guy in the checkered in the back, Cassie. And then uh, the woman in blue right there, right in front. Go ahead. Oh, um, hello. My name is Ben Neverov. I'm a freshman. Um, a little bit of background. My dad's actually from Moldova. Um, so, and my mom worked internationally overseas. Um, I was actually going to introduce myself to you later because I believe she may have worked with you with IREX. So, um, but my question was, and it's kind of a question that anyone can answer. Um, you mentioned how there were so many unpredicted factors of this war that have kind of allowed, kind of caused Russia to fail in terms of Western unity in response. And we've seen things that are kind of unprecedented. We've seen Germany um, abandon their pacifist um, ideology to send weapons to Ukraine. We've seen Switzerland pretty much abandon their stance of neutrality with sanctions. And we've even seen China refuse to openly support Russia and um, kind of act as a catalyst for them to still you know, participate in the economy around these sanctions. And part of my thing is, all this has been going on, and I think we can really attribute a lot of it to the power of social media. But my question is, do you think that Zelensky has kind of inspired some of this? Because we've seen so much from him on the ground, on social media, that we've never really seen from a leader before, I think, in terms of someone who he's refused to leave the country. You see him eating with his soldiers and everything. So I think it's, I think, can we attribute part of this response from other world leaders to a sense of sort of him inspiring them to act? Thanks, good question. Right here in the checkered shirt. Hi, my name is Salar Khan. Sorry, is that an echo? Anyways, my name is Salar Khan. I'm a sophomore here at William Mary. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Professor Oaks, you already kind of answered this, uh, what you all will be listening for in President Biden's State of the Union tonight, like that a lay person might not recognize as important, and what is the best way do you think he should make the argument to the American people and to the global stage as a whole? Okay, right here in the blue dress. Uh, yeah, hi, my name's Ava and I am a junior IR student here. Um, and so as an IR student, I feel like I fall into con contextualizing the situation using principal IR theory, um, considering like a multipolar world. And I guess I'm wondering, um, thinking about the US, Russia and China being like the three hegemons, where do you see that balance of power tipping? And then what would China's role be, if at all? OK. Steve, you have a microphone in your hand? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll jump in on a couple of things. First, uh, agreed that it's really remarkable to see all of these previously neutral powers or uncommitted powers commit, including the European Union itself, which was really quite remarkable, because you never would have expected them to play that role. Yeah, no question Zelensky staying put mattered. If you compare it to you know, uh, President Ghani in Afghanistan, for example, or President Yanukovych, who fled Ukraine. Uh, one of the things the Russians often say is this terrible coup happened with Yanukovych. Actually, the guy left the country. It makes it very difficult to have him as president when he's not in the country anymore. Leaving that aside, yeah, staying put and having the bravery definitely matters. However, and here's where I think Professor Oaks and I will disagree a little. Um, I am pretty impressed by the residual common values argument, and when I say residual, I mean it turns out that when you can afford to ignore the need to rally around the global liberal order and actually protect it militarily as well as diplomatically, then you can start having arguments about the end of sovereignty and you know petty disputes among this group or that group. But when there's a major invasion of a European country all out with mass casualties and refugees, it focuses the mind a lot. And I, I tend to think that's more enduring, I think, than Professor Oakes does. I hope I'm right, because definitely that's another possibility. Uh, so Zelensky, for sure, is a causal variable. But if we want to put it in political science terms, I would say you know, Putin really, really did quite a lot to unify the West as well. On um, China, I won't say anything about Biden tonight, because I, I don't have an expertise in that. But on China, yeah, we didn't talk about it, so I'll just say a few words quickly. Um, first, the Chinese put themselves in a really unenviable situation, which they're trying to find their way out of right now. Pretty clearly, Putin, I think they thought Putin knew something about his own neighborhood. So when they told Xi Jinping, you know, we got this. I mean, it's not really a nation. We're going to basically rattle our sabers and they'll all collapse. We'll do it after the Olympics, by the way, just like we did in Crimea, interestingly enough. So don't worry about being upstaged. And uh, they said, okay, sounds good. We're un you know, shakeable friends. Go right ahead. And of course, the Chinese are thinking that might bog down a little bit, which would be useful for China. 
I don't think they had any idea that Putin would be this far off in terms of what he could accomplish in a short term. So now, as you see, they're not condemning the invasion. Yeah, maybe they're failing to support it as robustly as they might, but they're also saying it's really NATO to blame. We would be happy to facilitate a solution. Sovereignty is a very important thing. In other words, a lot of abstractions, which are going to be harder and harder for them to, sus to sustain over time. Yeah, um, I will say I'm not an expert on any of the three things you guys talked about, but <laughs> I will try my best. Um, I think I think the one that I may be more qualified to answer is, um, and I'd answer in a similar way that uh, Steve did, um, is uh, the regard of Zelensky's, uh, the way that Zelensky ha has looked internationally. Um, one thing I will say uh, is that it is remarkably easy to come across as a strong, unified um, leader, A, when a country, when someone's invading your country, and B, uh, when that country is incredibly homogenous, which Ukraine is. Uh, Ukraine has arguably two ethnic groups, but those two ethnic groups are very close, closely correlated. Russians and Ukrainians are very close to one another. It's not, for example, say, Afghanistan, where you have 400 different ethnic groups all vying for power in specific regional places. Um, so in that sense, uh, it is easier for Zelensky to project strength. Um, he, he knows he has the backing of most of the country behind him, and he knows that most of the country has a somewhat similar mindset when it comes to ethnicity and the way that they, they all think together. Um, so I'm not sure that the Zelensky model can be necessarily, necessarily replicated. I think I would, I would say it's, it's probably more a country-to-country -country basis. I think it's a good way for leaders to look, to, um, for, for, to project strength. I think following his model is important, but I'm not sure it can be as easily replicated as a global model worldwide for leadership. Okay, so in terms of the question of what I hope to hear um, in the State of the Union address, um, what I'm really interested in hearing, well, first of all, the fact that a, that a majority of any State of the Union address gets to focus on foreign policy is incredibly rare and, and personally uh, delightful. Um, I'm really interested to see how he sells the conflict to the American public, um, since that's one of his main audiences. He could make a normative argument we have a responsibility to act because of democracy. We have a responsibility to act to protect state sovereignty. Or you can make a nationalist argument. The Russians are bad. They are a historic enemy of the United States. I mean, there's a lot of directions that he can actually go. Um, the ones he's chosen so far have been normative, but that is not inevitable. Um, so I'm interested to see in how he's selling that. Um, I'm also interested to see whether he's even, even tiptoe, and I totally understand why he would choose not to. Is he going to even tiptoe around um, talking about the potential costs of this current foreign policy? That's so hard for him right now, given that he's already having to talk about masks. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I know that sounds ridiculous. But he's incredibly unpopular because of the mask policy. It's a hugely divisive. And now he's going to have to talk about mask and then say, oh, by the way, I hope that you're OK paying $10 a gallon of gas to protect the Ukrainians. I, I'm just really curious to see if he can thread that needle. It's going to be a really tricky one because it's balancing both foreign policy and domestic political goals that have D domestic political issues, which have real consequences in the fall. Amy will be calling. Amy will be calling Jen Saki right after this, this <laughs> meeting. Um, Rebecca, there's a, one right here in the front row, um, in the red dress, and then who do you have on this side? Uh, in the back, go all the way to the back with the t-shirt on, gray t-shirt. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Kelly Drucko. I'm a professor in the government department, director of the International Justice Lab. You all know that. Um, I'm, I wanted to ask two questions. The first being, um, if you could talk about the permissive conditions the West created for this to happen. We talked first day in the human rights class. I see my lots of my students. Hi. Uh, 
Um, we talked the first day about how the most fundamental norm of international relations is the territorial integrity of the state and its sovereignty over domestic matters. This is not the first time in the last decade that Russia is transgressing that most fundamental norm of international relations and international law. So what piece of this do we take as the West or the international community more broadly that brought us to today? And what does our responsibility over the resolution of the conflict look like? Second, because, well, you're not all security people, but you know, for those of us who are human rights minded, would like, um, I'm wondering what you think about prospects for international justice, and again, how perhaps the US and the West undermines prospects for either state or individual criminal accountability, because the UK doesn't want to be at the ICC for abuses in Iraq, the US does not want to be at the ICC for abuses in Afghanistan, and Russia obviously does not want to be there, but Ukraine has ex accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court over um, atrocity crimes from 2013 to the present. Thanks. Great question. Uh, Rebecca, will you give the microphone to this guy back here? Go, go ahead, sir. Um, hi, I'm Nolan Coughlin. Um, I'm a freshman studying IR. And um, I was wondering, this is a direct question in relation to Professor Oakes's argument that um, um, U U.S. Uh, s citizens aren't really uh, aren't really ready to bear um, costs uh, aren't really aren't ready to bear costs related to the public good. Um, I w so d you you mentioned masking, and to me, I feel like there's a like a personal narrative in or like a narrative among the American public where they're not willing to bear costs for the public good when it relates to their personal freedom. But I feel like um, in history, Americans have been have been willing to bear economic and military costs, especially if there's a compelling narrative. For example, after 9/11, do you think that you know the Russian invasion in Ukraine could be such a narrative, or is that not possible? And one more question back here in the back. Nathan Colvin, I'm a PhD student at Old Dominion University. I was just wondering, from the perspective of Belarus, a lot of times we talk about Putin as being an opportunist and less of a strategist. Um, from what extent, when Lukashenko was isolated from the West, uh, that he no longer had any partners to turn to to leverage against Putin and, and play that balancing act, which then, uh, because of the election, isolated him, and he, he had no choice but to come kind of hat in hand to Putin. Um, that that accelerated the possibility of the formation of the Union State, which looks like, even though it's not being talked about specifically, is well on its way with the change in nuclear stance and the permanent basing of Russian uh, forces in Belarus. Uh, I guess my question is, is to what extent can we continue to support uh, these peaceful transitions of power and democracy without it possibly having second and third order effects like that that we don't anticipate? I do, but I'm actually going to answer three in one answer. Okay. No, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, ready? Permissive condition that allowed the situation to occur. I think one of the major factors is uh, decline in the sense of the United States is, American ro is, a, is a role model for democracy, um, which has been accompanied by slash slightly contributed to back democratic backsliding, a greater skepticism of the superiority of a liberal model, both economic and political, um, the increasing viability of the Chinese alternative. All of these things have helped create the conditions where a conflict like this can happen. It also means that it's gonna be very difficult to find a narrative that works because increasingly, I think you're having a hard time convincing people that democracy, liberal democracy is progress, that uh, free economies and globalization represent progress. So it's not entirely obvious to me that the traditional arguments we use to sell the liberal order have any kind of real currency with most people. And this is particularly true outside of the United States. Permissive.
Well, that's at least two of them. Yeah, sure. Um, once again, I am not fully qualified to answer any of the four questions asked. Um, I will say, however, um, I think the, the question of is this the West's fault is an important one. Um, I think the US, particularly in the last two decades, has had a really bad history with red lines. Um, we saw that in Syria. We saw that all over the Middle East. Uh, my background's in, um, in ethnic minority groups, particularly in the Middle East. Um, I was an Arabic minor, spent a lot of time in Jordan. Um, and the stories that you hear from refugees from the Syria conflict, refugees from the Lebanese conflict, refugees uh, even from, from uh, Kurdistan and then the Turkish conflicts, um, is, is really important that uh, to Professor Oakes's point, liberal democracy doesn't really sell anymore. And the fact that we keep pushing these narratives and they're not really following up with them ourselves uh, is, is really important. Um, I think if Biden wants to project strength tonight, he is going to have to, in part, recognize some of the failures of US foreign policy, particularly in a administration that he was a part of. Um, I mean, the red line that Obama drew in both Ukraine and Syria completely failed, and in Afghanistan. We, we, I mean, we can keep throwing names on it. Um, and so I think recognizing that tonight would be important and then making a, a commitment to liberal democracy moving forwards and projecting that sort of strength moving forward is, is important as well. So I that's. Uh, well, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Although I'm going to start with something slightly different. It's about timing of political arguments. This is a little, and it may be controversial. Right now is not the time to blame the United States, not at this particular juncture. And the reason I say that is that the Russian foreign ministry is very happy to republish all those arguments. They actually put John Mearsheimer's article, The West is to Blame for What's Going On in Ukraine, on the <laughs> Russian foreign, policy, uh, foreign ministry website today. And timing matters, you know, in rhetoric. It doesn't mean there aren't universal principles. It means that you have to understand how arguments are going to be used. And right now, the person to blame for what's going on, the killing, is Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. So that's the first point I want to make. Um, no, that doesn't mean we can't, as analysts, step back and say, what could we have done differently? And I, I think there, there's a really interesting set of complexities. So I, I will, full disclosure, I was actually on the 2008 Obama for America campaign as an advisor. There were some, you know, lots of academic advisors on various regional studies areas. Uh, Ambassador McFall was the leader of our group, and Celeste Wallander, who's now back in the administration, was number two, and I, I worked pretty closely with them. So full disclosure, you know, you could ask, why didn't we do more uh, in the early Obama administration? Not to do a reset, but to say, you know, George is already the red line, we, we can't uh, cross it. In retrospect, perhaps that's a mistake. I do want to tell you, though, and this is the kind of thing you'd only think about if you were there, is it was John McCain running for president who said, we are all Georgians now. Uh, and it didn't go anywhere. I mean, Americans had no reaction to that whatsoever. We actually, on the Obama campaign, did try to make the case that we would be strongly defending of the sovereignty of all former Soviet republics and that that was a critical principle of the reset. But, of course, it got drowned out in the general rhetoric of the reset, which I actually do have some problems with. And uh, Mike and Celeste and I have talked about that, so it's not that I'm saying it just now. Uh, it became known as everything going on in Putin's Russia is fine. And that, of course, was not the point. The idea was to start over in some ways and talk about security commonalities as well as pressuring on democracy and human rights. I think everyone's seen that Michael McFaul has been very powerfully promoting of those interests, uh, both as an ambassador and in the current situation as well. So it's a little bit of nuance, but relevant here because, you know, you have to have a co coalition that wins. And in politics, if you just go for the principle each time, you may not ever get to power and you may find yourself unable to change anything. 2014, I see, is very different. I think the annexation of Crimea deserved a much more universal and uh, allied response than it got. And there, I think our problem, frankly, is that we don't think globally. This country is still too parochial. Uh, people say, I don't know where Ukraine is on a map. And they'll say it with some pride. It's the weirdest thing about American culture. You should not be proud of that. Uh, William and Mary students should know where Ukraine is on a map, and all other of the 200 roughly independent and semi-independent countries in the world system. 200. Sorry for this. Many people hear this saw. I use it a lot. How many states are there in the United States? Thank you, 50. So if you're in college, you can do four times as many names. <laughs> 
Um, I, I recognize that uh, dinner is approaching, so we're going to do a lightning round. Please, when you get the microphone in your hand, tell us who you are and then ask a question. Don't make a speech, and our, res our panelists will be quick, too. Go ahead. Pick someone. Hi, Neil Kingsley, class of 79. My question is for Dr. Hansen, very quickly. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Neil Kingsley, class of 79. Dr. Hansen, very quickly, I was listening to Stephen Kotkin from Princeton a couple of weeks ago, who was looking at this um, problem from a systemic standpoint, drawing parallels to the, Rus the Soviet efforts to change the terms of the Versailles settlement in the 30s and early 40s. Um, so my question to you is, and his argument I think was that Putin perhaps is just the current incarnation of the so sort of the same effort to revise the post-Soviet settlement that they that they felt we were not a part of and was inimical to their interests. And my question to you is, how important do you think the person of Putin is in what has happened here? Or would something like this have inevitably happened um, in the hands of another Russian leader simply because of the way we treated Russia in the 90s? Yeah. Questions right here in the front? Oh, remember, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, hi, Roy Farachko. Uh, yes, Farachko is a Ukrainian last name, so there you go. Um, real quick, I have speech, but forget it. Professor Oak, so you're talking about uh, the U.S. being the weak link, and maybe I agree with that, um, and the NATO being collapsing as a credible institution. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Couldn't it be, be that this crisis is the thing that causes the United States and its allies to rethink how they approach security architecture and create a more nimbler, effective global institution to better protect the remnants of the um, international order? And last question right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Serena Patterson. I work for um, Aid Data at the Global Research Institute. And my question is, um, what uh, concessions do you think in a negotiation scenario that Putin would be willing to accept? And will those concessions be too dear for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people to bear? I'm just very worried about um, uh, Professor uh, Steve Hansen's scenario to a siege developing and then the um, negotiating period being extremely difficult. Panelists, you have only 60 seconds to respond. Sure. Pick your, pick carefully. If after we finish, uh, I'll ask the panel to stay up here if you want to come and chat with them. Steve, you're first. Yeah, I, on my four scenarios, I purposefully didn't put negotiated settlement in this context, which is the most depressing thing you may not have seen, but it's there. The problem is Putin thus far has shown absolutely no indication of settling for anything short of demilitarization of the entirety of Ukraine and even recognition of Crimea as you know, fundamentally part of Russia by the West, which are non-starters for Ukraine. Even if Zelensky wanted to make those concessions, he would be overthrown by his own people and lose all the support he just put together the moment he made those kind of concessions. That was already an issue in Ukrainian politics between Poroshenko and Zelensky prior to this. So there's absolutely no way now that any of those concessions are on the table in Ukraine. So it would really qu require Putin, or Putin's successor maybe, with scenario three or four, to say, okay, we're willing to come up with something more reasonable like forced deployments or military exercises exercises could be adjusted or we could hum come up with better security agreements uh, with the West on conventional arms or, or tactical nuclear arms or other things like that. That's what we tried to do in the Biden administration. I'm saying we as if I were in it. But, you know, we, the U.S., were trying to come up with these space-saving ways to say, here's a new agreement, and Putin summarily rejected them. So, unfortunately, the grounds for successful negotiation are pretty poor, but they should always be tried. Never weakness to go ahead and talk to the other side if you can. So that, that uh, I think, is fine to pursue. But I'm not very optimistic about it, which is why it wasn't a scenario. I'm running out of time. You're um, out of time. I got to say you this, though, because I was asked them. a question directly about Putin. Y y y look, personalities matter in history, right? I mean, it's both structure and agency. So that man matters a lot here. We did many things wrong in the 1990s. The stupidest thing we did, speaking of telling the truth to the American public tonight, we didn't tell the truth to the Russian population. We said, we can help you become a thriving, rich democracy in a couple years because there's a great formula. It's called the Washington Consensus. You apply it, everything is magic. And instead of saying that, we should have said, oh my goodness, you've just inherited 74 years of Soviet tyranny and disastrous economic planning. It's going to take you a very long time to get out of it. We're he here to help. And if we had given that message, maybe something could have shaped, shaped the Russian society's response more. Lincoln, teach the old people how to answer in 60 seconds. I, um, I'm also gonna tackle concessions quickly. Um, one of the, we just got, uh, I guess back in September, funding to write profiles on breakaway regions at Aid Data. Um, 
And I think that that is the only kind of way that at least, I don't, I don't want to pretend the way that concessions are going to go because I have no idea, but um, I could see Luhansk and Donetsk and Crimea becoming permanent parts of Russia. Um, I think that there's a, it's incredibly unlikely that Ukraine will ever get those back unless there's a complete change within the Biden, uh, or not Biden, Putin uh, regime and Putin administration that uh, Steve was saying. Amy, yep. you have the final word. Okay, ready? Watch how fast this is. And still intelligible. Okay, um, no. <laughs> I do not see that um, I can I can tell a story where you know the weakening of the like the United States taking a backseat in NATO could actually lead to a reform where the European our European partners take a front row and that could actually be great but we are not in a scenario where that's likely um, there's n to to achieve the kind of institutional change you are, that you're describing requires a long term commitment by American presidents to participate in that process. And what I think we've seen over the last six years is that there's a huge disagreement among American uh, presidents about the United States' future role in NATO. I don't, don't think that NATO can be revived if the United States really falls, you know, really starts taking a back seat. What I do think could happen is that the EU could step up more as a security institution and I have very limited data, but I'd like to point to Germany's massive increase in defense spending. Gang, thanks for staying here uh, so for so long. Um, I will, I'll say just two things uh, to, end, to end the night. Uh, first, it's, um, this is the first big event that we've had in two years at the Global Research Institute in person. Um, we've done a whole bunch of things online, and they're okay, but it's nothing like being in a room with a bunch of really smart William Mary students asking tough questions of their professors uh, to get you thinking and to continue the conversation. So for that, I thank you. On the bad news side, it's awful that this is what we came back to talk about. Um, you know, sort of the, the human cost of what's going on right now in Ukraine is enormous and it's, I fear it's gonna get a lot, lot worse. Um, so on the other hand, on the good news side, uh, our panelists are very generous. Please uh, join me in, in uh, thanking them.